Good morning, folks. You mean that, right? <laughs> you know, in New England, there's this thing. Uh, if you like the weather, or it can also go as, if you don't like the weather, they'll say, just wait a minute. You know? And uh, today we ordered our, uh, you know, we wanted variety. We're all about diversity here. So did you all rest well? Are those uh, short-term memory registers all cleared up? <laughs> and uh, what, what's this? You're forgetting curves exercised, and uh, you're all set for deeper learning. Is that right? OK, so, uh, but actually, it's, it's very interesting. I was, uh, you know, the, the, the panel uh, uh, at the end uh, yesterday when Sanjay was presenting, one of the things that's really happened, and I was reflecting on our last two years over here, uh, uh, where uh, the emphasis, and, you know, this has been, and it's, it was reflected in uh, uh, Sanjay's presentation yesterday, has been to really challenge a lot of how we think about teaching and learning and also look at the science of learning, you know, and so, sort of, and building that culture in the institute, and especially amongst us, uh, uh, those of us who are working in this Office of Digital Learning, you know, because a lot of stuff that we might have been doing uh, just out of habit, you know, and getting into the, to think as learning scientists, you know, to get into that culture. And it's quite tremendous, because for people like me, who have been with educational technology, educational, uh, forever, you know, this, uh, these are times where I could have died and gone to heaven. You know, this is a kind of environment that you hoped would come when you look at all these uh, innovations, when you look at all the stuff that's been going on with technology, with open resources, and saying maybe uh, we are really, uh, uh, you know, at a time where you can think about uh, some deep transformation. Uh, Bob Metcalf, uh, uh, who's, a, you know, who's an MIT product, and largely known as the father of Ethernet technology. Uh, once we were having a futuring session over here, and he says, look, you know, when a system, an educational system collides with an innovation system, uh, you know, there are many things, many possible outcomes. One is that nothing may happen. Uh, two is that superficial change might happen in one of the systems, in education or the innovation. And the... the and the third is that really dramatic change happens, you know, both in the, in the innovation, intervening innovation, and the system that, it, uh, that responds to it. You know. It takes a very long time and may happen sometimes. You know. And uh, so uh, naturally the third is possibly the desirable outcome. And uh, I think we both in terms of access and quality and how we think about learning, learning across, uh, I certainly feel that we are beginning to see glimpses uh, of this kind of deep transformation. Now, that said, today's theme, and yesterday when I was uh, uh, trying to frame these two and a half days, uh, we talked about one of the significant th themes here being uh, bridging the educational divide. And, uh, uh, you know, access, quality access, access to quality, uh, that's the game, that's... Uh, the game we're all in, you know, it's a, it's, it's a hard game. Uh, and uh, at the access gap, the educational divide, is manifest in different, different, different ways, you know. There is the real access gap, or last night, as we were discussing, the actionable access gap. Uh, there are achievement gaps. There are opportunity gaps. So, so the educational divide is manifest in, in, in several ways. And if you look at the last few years, it's been particularly exacerbated by a lot of things. You know, we look at countries, I'm particularly familiar with the Indian context, uh, you know, countries like India, which are in a gallop for development, which, uh, you know, which is reflected in the demand for knowledgeable human resources in every sector, carpenters, engineers, doctors, nurses, and uh, wanting to uh, educate people uh, at, uh, at a remarkable rapid rate. You know. There's that kind of exacerbation. There's this other stuff that we have talked about where you know, the marketplace places, places its demands are changing marketplace influenced by, by technology and other forces, uh, demands skills and competencies which are quite different from those that used to exist and which are rapidly changing. Uh, there's a particular new phenomenon. Well, it's not really new, but something that's become very, very uh, in our face you know, when we talk about displaced populations, uh, when we think about uh, uh, social, political crises like those in Syria, and which present, uh, you know, uh, uh, this, which really uh, highlight the, the need to bridge 
the educational divide. You know, people who are rendered, rendered uh, access uh, free, uh, not out of choice, you know, because of the particular social circumstances, because of stuff that they have absolutely no control over. So the, the divide has, is manifest in different ways. The divide is exacerbated by a variety of situations. And we all hope you know, that the promise and potential of all these things that we talk about, technology open, will really uh, address these gaps. Of course, uh, the caution that we all, and you heard this in spades yesterday, is that we don't confuse the digital divide with the educational divide. You know? I mean, you might uh, come up with a variety of solutions, you know, all the way from global networks to Raspberry Pis and you know, what have you. To, uh, to, make, to, you know, to bridge the digital divide. Uh, but then does that equate to, uh, it, it is a subset of, you know, like we said, it is a possibly a necessary but not a sufficient con condition to bridge the educational divide. Uh, there are also times when you think, well, if you have a lot of good policy, then, you know, and if you focus on policy, good things will happen. And I'm, I'm again, uh, drawing from my familiarity with the Indian context, you know, over the years, from 2006 on, and I'll get corrected by my uh, colleagues from India, uh, there have been lots of uh, policy uh, implementations. There was a universal primary education mandate in India. You know? uh, this was a Sarva Shiksha Abhiyan, and uh, which, you know, which was essentially to provide primary school access to all, all kids. And that was wonderful. What had happened was it generated millions of kids uh, who were, came out of the primary school system who had nowhere to go. They fell through the cracks because there were not enough the middle school infrastructure was not developed, was not in a place where they could go. You know? So it was well-intended, well-meaning policy. And, and, and the kicker was that you could not, I mean, this is, of course, a mildly caricatured, exaggerated statement, I'm sure, but you could not build a traditional school a week in order to meet the demand of all these people who fell through the cracks. You know? So the point over there is policy is important, but, but uh, uh, you know, it, uh, the, the traditional ways of addressing this demand, humongous demand, you know, were at, at best, well-intended as they were, uh, were inadequate. You know? So it, you know, uh, the push is to look at these things, look at these things uh, in an integrative way. And our speakers, our presenters, our discussions today are really going to address uh, this topic of the educational divide and uh, with, you know, br bringing their experience, their expertise into play to talk about particular aspects of the problem as they see it, uh, the profundity of the problem, potential solutions, and I think, and then, you know, hopefully uh, lead us into some very good discussion about how we might address uh, the potential to to, you know, to mitigate this divide, to bridge this divide. Uh, first and foremost, I'm, I'm really very, very pleased to introduce a new colleague, new friend. And I say new only because I just met her about uh, uh, six months ago, a year maybe. And, uh, and, you know, as you will see, uh, what I saw, the energy and passion to make educational change. You know? And uh, I'm talking about Mesa Jalbut. Uh, who's recognized from, from the Algorad Foundation. You heard uh, several references to it yesterday. Mesa is a recognized uh, leader in the field of education. She has a special interest in using educational technology to advance quality education in developing countries. Uh, there's a lot I'm going to say about, uh, uh, about Mesa, perhaps not enough, but I would encourage you to go look her up and look at some of the... the the, the projects and the papers, the position papers that she has put out. Uh, I was, uh, it, it was really meaningful for me to see. Uh, so in addition to authoring reports and advising on edtech policies, she's actively, she's actively supported innovative edtech initiatives in her new role as Chief Operating Officer of the Abdullah al Ghurair Foundation of Education. The foundation creates opportunities to activate the untapped potential of Arab youth providing underserved, high-performing students with scholarships, support, and skills, training that they need to thrive, and now, as we know, to thrive in whatever environment that they might uh, uh, confront. She has over 20 years' experience in building organizations, initiatives, and partnerships targeting young people throughout Canada, the Middle East, and in developing nations. She was the founding CEO of the Queen Rania, 
uh, Foundation, uh, uh, another uh, friend and supporter of some significant MIT initiatives, including uh, uh, edX. She's also a trusted advisor to global figures. She has produced highly visible research and strategies in several fields of education, in developing, uh, including development, including refugee education, and Arab youth learning and skills in her capacity as non-resident fellow at the Brookings Institute in Washington, DC. She spent the early years of her career in Canada, where she held senior roles in a number of national and international organizations. Initiatives focused on improving education, uh, development and youth employment, including the Canadian International Development Agency and Human Resources Development Canada. Finally, Mesa, Ms. Jalbut, has served on the boards of well-recognized nonprofits. She's currently a, a member of the Board of Governors of the International Baccalaureate Organization, IB as we know it. Mesa. Good morning, and thank you, Vijay, for that a very kind introduction. And congratulations to you, uh, Sanjay, Anin, and the entire team on organizing such a successful conference. It's been packed with informative presentations, thoughtful uh, exchanges, and many takeaways for the future of online learning. Colleagues, I'm delighted to be here, and thank you for joining me uh, so early in the morning. I suspect uh, some of you have uh, been hearing about this rumor going around MIT hallways that there's this new Arab organization funding bold online learning initiatives. I'm afraid the rumor is true. Well, at least only partially. I'm not here to hand out blank checks. Instead, I'm here to pick up digital tips from all of you. You see, our founder, Abdullah al hurair a generous and gracious Emirati businessman, has entrusted us with a big bank account, $1.1 billion to be exact. But he's also charged us with an even bigger mandate, giving at least 15,000 of the brightest underserved Arab youth the opportunity at an education at the best universities in the world. How hard could that be, you ask? We just need to find many deserving Arabs and send them to great universities. Not so easy, it turns out. The Abdullah al ghurair Foundation for Education is young, 10 months old. But we've already learned one very important lesson. Taking the narrow path of a foundation funding scholarships at traditional universities on its own is not going to be enough. Why is this? Now, I'm sure you are very well read and many of you have been to the region, but let me share just three facts that illustrate the challenges of the context we're working in. First, there is the enormous youth demographic in the region. The Arab world is home to the highest proportion of youth in the world. Over half of its 385 million people who live on just 5 million square meters are under 25 years of age. Second, there is the tragedy of how many of those young people's futures are trapped in conflict. Over 84 million people across the region are affected by conflict, including refugees and internally displaced people. Among Syrian refugees alone, there are more than 110,000 young people who now cannot access higher education. Just pause for a second and imagine with me what it's like for a country to lose out on educating an entire generation. They may not all have studied at MIT, but the impact is just as striking as if almost all 132,000 MIT alumni 
would not have been able to go to university. Third is the devastating wasted potential of unemployed youth. Over 30%, at over 30%, the Arab region has the highest youth unemployment rate in the world. And 40%, over 40% of employers in the region blame the low quality of education for creating that mismatch between the skills and the job market needs and what the education sector is producing. These are just three of the challenges that have shaped the solutions we are seeking and the opportunities we're developing through digital learning. We believe the time is right now more than ever for the Arab world not to only invest in digital learning, but to also innovate and insist on creating solutions that meet the needs of its young people and not only import Western models. It is the right time for the Arab world because Arab countries are making rapid progress in expanding internet connectivity. By 2018, there are expected to be some 226 million internet users, users in the Arab world. That amounts to more than 55% of the population, almost 7% higher than the global average. The United Arab Arab Emirates alone has the highest internet penetration in the world. Despite this phenomenal growth in internet access, young people in the region still mostly use the internet and mobile phones to only access social media for social purposes. And not a single university in the Arab world offers accredited online learning. No and, and no government allows them to do so. By contrast, here in the US, one in four students are taking some of their courses at a distance, while one in seven students are taking all of their higher edu education courses online. So we are asking ourselves a very important question. How then is the Arab world, as it begins to close its digital divide, could we spread digital learning and bridge the education divide? You all know about the potential of digital and blended learning models, so I'm not going to spend time talking about that. I do, however, want to take a moment to share with you why we're optimistic about its potential for the region. We believe digital learning could help us close the education divide in at least three ways. By scaling up access, by improving quality, and by reskilling or upskilling young people. For starters, I spoke about the sheer number of young people who need access to affordable education. Once a community has internet access, as the Arab world increasingly does, scaling up online learning to reach the millions of young people who are currently out of school or do not have access to high quality institutions can be done at a relatively low cost. The Arab world's few strong institutions of higher education certainly could not accommodate that many students. And even if they could, they might choose not to. We've seen firsthand how universities in the region and around the world have shut their doors in the faces of refugees from Syria and elsewhere, forcing them to overcome huge bureaucratic and financial hurdles. The second challenge is the low quality of education currently being delivered. For far too long, most of the region's post-secondary institutions have operated without having to prove that the education they provide aligns with global quality standards and expectations. Through online learning, it would be far easier to measure progress and ensure that students are acquiring knowledge and skills they can actually use. Meanwhile, online learning can facilitate the introduction of new and innovative teaching and learning methods. For example, a, redu a reduction in traditional lecturing and rote learning 
could create the space for the kinds of self-paced and personalized learning and assessment tools being used by professors delivering MOOCs on edX and other online education platforms. Third, the Arab world faces the challenges, the challenge of delivering continuous learning. In order to thrive in today's fast-changing economic environment, where technology is making many jobs redundant and rewarding greater specialization, workers everywhere must consistently upgrade or expand their skill sets. As it stands, only wealthy young people in the Arab world without personal commitments such as families and jobs can pursue continuous learning in the form of graduate degrees from top universities. Open and online courses can level the playing field by offering professionally recognized credentials that boost a person's career prospects. The magnitude of the education challenges the region is facing makes it incumbent on us to try to leapfrog in digital learning. That includes partnering with the most innovative education institutions in the world and investing in building the ecosystem to spread and innovate within the region. Taking all of this into consideration, we've created the al Horer Open Learners Scholar Program, aimed at making some of the best education in the world available online to Arab youth uh, through online degrees and, and programs and recognized credentials. We're setting the bar high by establishing our first collaboration with MIT. The two new MicroMaster programs that we're funding, consisting of five 12-week courses in STEM subjects, are not currently offered in the Arab world. We expect these programs will attract significant interest from students and employers in the region. But in order to maximize the impact of our investment, perceptions of online learning must also change. And this will require a joint effort by educational institutions, government, and the private sector. Indeed, Arab education institutions must themselves begin to explore the development of high-quality online programs. For their part, governments should reconsider their position and start recognizing online learning delivered by high-quality institutions. As for the private sector, the key will be to reward employees with degrees and certificates received through online programs. Ladies and gentlemen, as we tackle the how, we do not let ourselves forget why we're pursuing this non-traditional path of investing in online learning. As I've shared with you today, we have many good reasons. In fact, we have 13,400 good reasons. That's the number of applications we've received since we launched our online scholarship process just a month ago. In addition to the information and essays young people send us online, we also talk with them at universities and through webinars, and we hear firsthand about their anxieties and ambitions. Their inspiring stories have become the fuel that gets us through a rather grueling schedule right now. There's a new story every day, but some of the ones that have stuck with me include the story of Karim, a young man from Morocco who came to an information session uh, with us uh, and, his, and his older sister, uh, in the UAE. His sister works several jobs to finance his education. She's managed to get him through two years at an excellent local university, but a rather expensive one. He's studying computer engineering, and he has a 3.82 GPA. But they're finding it difficult to keep going, and he's now on financial probation. Kareem may have to leave university to work if he does not find a scholarship. And then there's Maryam, a young woman living in Syria. 
Her and her family have endured the harshest conditions under conflict. She's lost her father and her home, but she refuses to lose her dream of one day being part of rebuilding Syria as a civil engineer. Maryam is contemplating risking her life to go to Europe if she does not find a way to study in Syria. And finally, there's Ahmed, a young Egyptian who's been accepted to study electrical engineering at one of the top universities in the world and to carry out his proposal to develop a new medical device for amputees. Ahmed cannot afford to go to this university and his optimism will come undone if he does not find funding in the next two months. With these stories and thousands more like them, perhaps the question that we all need to be asking ourselves is how can we not consider the potential of digital learning in the Arab world? And if we do not do so, we would risk allowing the majority of young people to be left behind. Thank you for listening. There's time for questions or feedback. I'd love to hear your thoughts. And please, as, uh, as we did yesterday, really appreciate your coming up to the mic over here with your questions. And, uh... Hello. Um... You talked about it already that no uh, national government at the moment is exacting online education. I know there's a lot of things going on in Jordan and Lebanon in general in the region. What is your personal expectation when we probably could see and expect a change? Did, did you mean a lot of things? Did you mean by? Um, I think there's a lot of consultations going on. There were like I think alone in the last five months seven conferences, including the High Education Ministry, the Education Ministry almost all of the universities in the region. So I have the feeling that there is something moving, but it's an outside perspective. Right. Well, there, there's, there are lots of exciting initiatives taking root um, in the Arab world around online learning. Um, and I see NAF is here with IDRAK, and uh, there are others, you know, there are initiatives such as NEFHAM, and there's Durub in Saudi Arabia. Those are all open online. Uh, platforms, but those courses um, are largely not accredited, uh, and they're not uh, necessarily um, integrated into the university education being offered by institutions across the region. It's not that it isn't being discussed, it's just that there, they, there hasn't been a demonstration of will uh, to move on it, uh, despite the enormous opportunity. There are some hurdles and there are some re you know, reasons uh, for hesitation, uh, but it you know, it, we think that it's, it's imminent and necessary to tackle the massive education challenge that exists. And, and you know, others can feel free to, to input on, uh, into that. Um, we, we know some universities are interested in considering it, but they would, not, they would only do so if the governments that the, you know, where they work actually agreed to accredit those courses. So that's also a major hurdle. I wanted to ask you about uh, regulation. So what is it that's keeping uh, the acceptance of online? I mean, what, what's the history here? Is this, and it's, it seems Middle East wide, I actually think there's a problem with this in India as well. Uh, I don't know about the rest of Asia. Is this some sort of um, inherited sort of rules that they're sticking to? Where does the regulation come from? Hmm. Uh, one of the reasons is that uh, the the region is, ha, has been bombarded with sort of for-profit um, uh, fake universities offering online degrees to, to students. And, and there's, been, you know, there's been uptake by, by students only to find out later that, you know, they, uh, that education is not going to be recognized or that they didn't receive that quality education they thought they were receiving. So there's a lot of reluctance. Uh, to accept them uh, without introducing proper regulations. So what we're suggesting is that they start making it clear what is required, what is the framework, so that institutions that are interested in going into that space know what the government um, um, 
is requiring. And, and it's also incumbent on the institutions offering education to make sure that they're working with the ministries of education and the quality assurance um, departments to ensure that they're meeting standards at the outset. We've heard of many um, well-intentioned initiatives, even by top universities in the world, where they come in and they start offering a course only to realize that you know, they should have done it the other way around. And I think it's a parallel uh, a process. But, you know, uh, Sanjay, I will say, and, and, and um, uh, the chairman of the foundation said this a few days ago, last week actually, when we were launching the, the, the MIT MicroMasters together and Chancellor Grimson was there. If we're offering the best education online from the best universities in the world, it's going to be very difficult for government or anyone to say that this is not a valid education. And we're, we're going to start seeing employers jump the queue you know, where they come out and say, this is a good education, we recognize this. Any student or any youth who takes these courses is welcome to our company. That's going to change the dynamic entirely. That's what we're banking on. Great, thanks, thanks, Mr. Thank okay. Hello, oh, um, my question is about teachers. Uh, you know, to, um, you have a huge amount of students, and if you want to, you know, even to start uh, online education, well, I'm, I know you may be talking more about university level, but I think it's also like from the younger age. So here you need at least teaching assistants, uh, at least somebody who would, you know, um, teach students how to use those resources. So do you have any prob programs, uh, you know, to, to have more uh, teachers for that? Well, you've put your finger on one of the major challenges that mm -hmm. I didn't mention mm -hmm. in the speech. There were just far too many, mm -hmm. actually. Um, uh, having enough teachers and mm -hmm. having good quality teaching is one of the major challenges mm -hmm. the Arab world faces. And we certainly don't have enough teachers who are trained in providing quality mm -hmm. digital mm -hmm. education. So that has to be part of the strategy. Okay. Uh, and um, we're... At the moment, uh, for us as a foundation, we're focused on the higher education mm -hmm. level and the transition from secondary to higher mm -hmm. education. Mm -hmm. But there are lots of organizations who are starting to think about how do you um, upskill current <laughs> teachers so that they can teach better, even in a traditional mm -hmm. context. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, as a I'm a, from the developing country, and I'm a Fulbright scholar as well. I'm a Fulbright alumna. So it's very important for me, this type of scholarship, because it promotes this kind of developing. I'm from El Salvador, so it's very hard. But uh, have you thought about how to keep this human capital that you're going to promote in the country? Because one of the problems that I'm facing, I'm studying a PhD now, but I'm pretty sure that I'm going back to my country. Uh, but uh, this type of scholarships sometimes need to address this um, how to keep this stock of human capital that you're promoting into their country. So, uh. That's right. Well, f first of all, good for you for planning on going back to your country. Um, we um, are hoping that um, every young person that ha you know, is given an opportunity through these scholarships, through the foundation, um, considers themselves um, you know, part of the solution in the future, an investment into the future of the region. Uh, and we're not, you know, we don't have any legal requirement uh, to, to, to do that. We believe that the best way to, to encourage them to do so uh, is to give them the kinds of opportunities that allow them to consider the region uh, you know, as somewhere where they can have an impact. So we've made a commitment that for every graduate that we send to university, we are going to make sure that they have a job when they graduate. And you know, we think if, if we're good at selection and we're finding the best students out there uh, and sending them to the best universities, then employers will want them. So hopefully that works out. Thank you. Thank you for the presentation. <clears throat> uh, you talked about regu uh, regulations and regulators. I wanted to ask, how do you intend uh, bringing in the policymakers into what you're doing presently, considering the fact that if they already understand what you know, they would have set up policies and frameworks for it to work. But right now, you're bringing up something that 
for some of them, they have actually not upscaled to that level. You know. So how do you intend bringing them into uh, the context of what you're working on? The universities, I mean. The policymakers, right? The policymakers, now. right. Um, I, I think, you know, there's, there's going to, um, we're, we're trying to create a movement. And it, it's, it's going to pick up steam very quickly. And, and we think that they will want to be part of the discussion as opposed to sit it out. Uh, and we've already had really good reactions from you know, the first investment we're making with the two MicroMasters uh, at MIT. And we think that um, you know, engaging them in, for example, what courses we fund is going to be part, you know, an important part of the discussion, an important part of bringing them to the table. Because they're also very well aware that they need to um, you know, upskill students, they need to improve the, the quality of, of the outcome of education and provide employers with uh, young people who have the right skills. So uh, that's already a very compelling argument to be, to be engaged uh, in, in the discussion. It may take a little bit longer than, than we hope. We're, we're very optimistic. But we know that some countries, more than others, will be readier to, to come to the table. Last question. Sure, sure, sure. Um, I heard a lot of really great vision. I was wondering, could you expand a little bit on your measures for success? How are you going to know, what are your milestones for knowing that you're on the right track and that you're getting done what you want to get done? Um, well, we have obviously you know, milestones that um, we need to take care of in the short term, and that's uh, you know, selection, selecting the best uh, kids that are fit for these scholarships is extremely important. So we, we are actually sending students to local universities and some universities around the world in you know, the, the normal model of education. Um, we're, not, we're not pulling that all away, but we think that that's not enough, so this is partly why we're in, in um, uh, digital education. But I would, so, so selection is one thing, and I would say also the success process to actually complete uh, the university education is extremely important. Um, for all the scholarships that are being offered around the world, there's actually not enough information and research to indicate what are the success measures and how do you ensure that young people complete their education, even in a traditional model. But what we do know is that support at the university is extremely important. And obviously, that's not going to be any less important in a digital learning environment. Uh, and this is why I emphasized in my speech that we need solutions that speak to the challenges the Arab world are facing. So if you're talking about a Syrian refugee who's sitting in Zaatari camp in Jordan, he has a slightly different learning environment than a student sitting in Dubai and, and working in uh, a big company. So we need to be able to cater that education to, uh, to their needs. And we know there are some barriers for entry. And so part of our success measures will be to ensure that those barriers um, are reduced over time. So for example, um, we know English is, is, a, is a barrier among young people who go to public schools. Uh, and they happen to be among our target group. So we need to work with other institutions to make sure that young people who deserve that chance, who have the potential to succeed, get the opportunity to learn English. And there are many other things I'd be happy to talk to you about. Quite a long list of KPIs, let's say. Well, thank you very much, Mesa. Thank, thank you very you. much. Uh,